Welcome everybody, my name is Dan Combest, and today we'll be talking about vehicle tire modeling and elements. So some of the goals for today's webinar, I'd like to introduce some important background about tire and wheel flow topology. I'd also like to give you a quick overview of wheel modeling approaches that include tire influences, and hopefully by the end of this you'll obtain a sense of how wheel models are applied within aero cases within elements. I'd like to accomplish all of this in around 20 minutes, maybe a little bit longer. And because we only have 20 minutes, we'll answer all the questions via email post-webinar. So feel free to just hit reply on the invite email, and that will go directly to me, and then I can get you back and answer as soon as possible. So we'll start with a little background, then I'll talk about wheel modeling approaches. I'll dive into a learn by example, and then I'll leave you with a few take-home messages. First off, why are we concerning ourselves with tires and wheels? Well, accurate wheel modeling is really required. So tires and wheels have a significant impact on drag. When I say significant, I mean up to 25 or 30 percent, including the wheel wells themselves. It also has an, an even larger potential impact on lift. And in terms of WLTP approval, we need to have this accuracy within our CFD results in order to actually achieve approval. With wheels, there's significant simulation challenges. There's fine detail in many different components in the treads. Um, there's geometric complexity in the treads, the rims, and, and just how things are in close proximity to each other. So there's lots of things to be considered in the meshing, and if we're looking at sliding mesh, how these interact. There's also wheel ground interaction and then there's rotating and deforming surfaces that we may or may not want to take into account. In terms of background for wheel and tire physics, first off, flow topology is not simple. It's not just a bluff body simulation. It's not just um, any other simulation that you might think you're encountering. There's stagnation points, there's contact patch vortices that are caused by deformed tires, there's flow separation over the top of the tire. There's uh, influences from the floor because the floor creates this upper lower asymmetry uh, in this wheel system. So it's not as simple as this bluff body and air flowing around. And in this case, on the left, we've got a fixed wheel versus a turning wheel. And these are freestanding wheels. So of course, this is going to be very different from something that you might encounter in a passenger vehicle. In both of these cases, wheel wake horseshoe vortices dominate. So if you look in the figure on the left, we've got one in both of these. These are the horseshoe vortices, and both of these dominate in a fixed wheel and also in a turning wheel scenario. The differences between rotating and a stationary wheel is that the there's a slight drag reduction in a rotating wheel scenario. And there's really different separation bubbles and different vortices that are forming over the back of the tire. Now remember, this is a standalone tire on itself. So if we're looking at something that has a wheelhouse, well, flow topology gets even more complicated with the wheelhouse. And so there's lots of different interactions. There's broken inner and outer symmetry. So now that we have this vehicle and there's air that's moving under the vehicle on one side of the tire and then there's the, this external air around the tire it's two different environments so there's broken inner and outer symmetry there's the upper wake ring vortex is really shielded and by shielded i mean it's a different environment there's not the air isn't moving over the top of the tire through the treads the same way that it would be with a standalone tire and in this case rims play a greater role as they interact with oblique air and so as the air moves around the front of the vehicle or in the wheelhouse, there's lots of interactions with the air in the coming out of the rims and interacting with the rims themselves. The contact and wake vortices, so the moving ground is actually a strong influence on the contact and wake vortices. And then also the oblique and underbody air are key because they interact with all of these vortices at the bottom of the tire and so as a whole, the wheel, the rims, the tires, the wheelhouse, some of the rotating components behind the rim like the disc brakes, uh, and then some stationary components like the calipers, 
can all affect how air moves through this component on the vehicle. And then when we throw in treads, it makes this even a more complicated system. Now, I've only got 20 minutes, so I'm not going to be able to dive into verification and validation of any of the models that I'm talking about. But if you'd like a little bit more detail about this, my colleague Paolo Jeremia put on a webinar last year on the development of an innovative method for CFD-based WLTP tire modeling. And he has lots of uh, test cases and lots of good information about trends and which methodologies predicted better trends. Let me talk a little bit about wheel modeling approaches. In terms of the rotating wheel boundary condition, again, it's implemented as a boundary condition, which means that there's no extra meshing requirements. So this is really nice for the user because we mainly just concern ourselves with um, local refinements or volume refinements or distance refinements on the wheel itself, and we don't need to consider adding extra zones or worrying about a sliding mesh interface. So it's typically very stable and something that we can work with very easily. The boundary condition itself is based on hub speed and contact radius, and the angular velocity is calculated for the user. Each rotating face has a fixed tangential velocity based on distance from the center of rotation, but one of the drawbacks is that there's no normal component of velocity on the face. For generalized moving reference frame, GRF, it's a zone-based model applied to the tire treads themselves. So if you don't have tire treads, there's no GRF. So if we had a smooth tire, this is not going to work for us. So we need a groove tire. And so one of the main benefits of GRF, and if you go back and look at the other webinars that we have, it can handle non-circular zones. So this means that it can handle deformed tires and treads. So we can capture even the region underneath the tire that might have deformed treads very easily. It's faster and more stable than MRF due to its formulation. And again, there's an automated frame selection within elements itself. However, for GRF, we need to make sure that we ensure local refinement captures the depth of the treads to improve the accuracy. The sweeping method is done automatically within elements when using the GUI or the client server or Python. However, if you're not using that and you're using something like PBS or Slurm or some other queuing system, you need to make sure that you call TopoSet in parallel to launch the application to create the cell zone after the mesh has been created. For a sliding mesh interface, this involves actual rotation of the mesh. So you can see right here, so this is physically moving the mesh, where the other two methods aren't doing anything with moving the mesh at all. It's more accurate because it captures the rim influence more accurately, but it comes at a higher computational cost. Sliding mesh interfaces are almost always coupled with other methods, so the tire wall using a rotation uses a rotating wheel boundary condition, the tire tread uses GRF, and then the rotating rims uses a sliding mesh with a rotating region. So we typically couple all three of these together to get maximum accuracy. So one of the challenges of using a sliding mesh interface is the actual slider creation. And so here we've got a full wheel, and let me just take a quick cutaway of that tire itself. And you'll see that I've got the tire, I've got the rim, I've got a uh, disc right here from a disc brake. If I wanted to, I could also have a caliper, but I need to make sure that I had either space between the caliper so I can fit the sliding mesh interface between the caliper and the disc. But for simplicity, today I'm leaving out the caliper. First off, you need to identify the axis of rotation and define a starting point on the rotational axis. Next, you need to draw a 2D polygon to enclose a rotating component. And you need to make sure that you avoid non-rotating components like a caliper. Next, you need to evolve the 2D polygon around a rotational axis. And one tip that I can say is avoid low precision geometry modelers. Use a CAD tool or something that has a high resolution uh, geometry that's created when you do this rotational extrusion. 
And the reason why is because if you have an asymmetric solid, when you're trying to rotate that or twist it in the mesh and rotate the mesh, you'll have face overlap. So overall, it must have rotational symmetry. You can repeat this for each wheel or copy, translate, rotate that exact surface if you have all the, um, if all the wheels are exactly the same or if they're very similar. All right, now that I've identified the different approaches that are possible and just generally how they relate to each other, let me go through an example. First off, a typical CFD analysis requires geometry import, import surface manipulation, mesh setup, uh, simulation setup, you simulate, you post-process, and you have your results. However, with elements, there's an arrow wizard that simply you bring in the geometry, then you categorize the geometry and perform an arrow setup, and then launch the applications to just mesh setup, perform the arrow CFD and post-processing. So most of the process is actually autom automated. And by doing so, we are able to increase consistency between runs and between team members. It also reduces errors, and it's an overall time savings because a lot of this is automated. And in the end, there's increased accuracy per simulation. All right, let me jump over to the GUI. For this example, I've already brought in all the geometry. I've already categorized it in terms of the different assembly types. And because we're talking about wheels, I'm only going to focus on the wheel area right here. So by default, the wheels are going to use the rotating wheel boundary condition themselves. All right, so for that, we just need to make sure that we have a center of rotation and the axis of rotation set correctly. Now, in order to apply the GRF, we only want to apply this to the grooves. So we can see right here, we've got a tire with grooves. And all I need to do is select that patch that's split up and turn on the GRF. So I just need to repeat the GRF for each one of the different treads. Then after that, I need to go set up the rest of the vehicle and set up the wind tunnel, set up the test speed, and then everything else should be done automatically, meaning the rotating wheel velocity is going to be set automatically based on the, the wheel speed, sorry, the vehicle speed. And then the rotational uh, speed of the GRF itself is set up based on that. So then I would just hit apply settings and then I would pack up my case and go to the cluster. Now, if I was going to do AMI, then there's a few extra steps that I need to do. Before I start my simulation, I need to copy my elements templates, make another copy of the folder, and then come in here to auto.defaults and then just make sure that I change my wheel treatment to AMI, and then I uncomment this section right here to pick up any uh, prefixes that I might have to the STLs themselves. Then I would close the GUI, open it back up, and then I would be able to load up this new template. So let me just go all the way back to my template. So let's go up to the configuration files. Let me switch over to AMI. So that'll reset everything. I still have all my geometry, but now I can go back to my wheels and you can see this new entry for AMI. So for the AMI, I really only want to apply that to the rims themselves. So what I need to do is I need to import my AMI sliders and I've made those ahead of time. So here I've got different AMI sliders for my different wheels. So I've got one, two, three, four. Let me bring those in. And you can see that it's already prepended the geometry because I've done this before. And so it's automatically selected that and turned it on. And for the GRF, that's automatically on because I've brought this in before and set that to GRF. So each one of the grooves are going to have GRF. Those are all on. And then each one of the AMIs are going to have those are also going to be on because that's going to represent my sliding mesh interface. One thing I need to make sure is that the rotational axes of each one of these are correct. And I need to make sure that they line up with everything else. So I can go through and manually change each one of these numbers if I know them. I can use the widget to set it for me or I can try to automatically sense it with some of the tools that are in Elements. So at this point, I have a case that has a 
rotating wheel boundary condition on the tire walls themselves. The tire grooves have a GRF and then the tire rims have an AMI and this part is going to be part of the rotating mesh. Everything is set up. I just need to hit apply settings and then pack up my case and send it over to the cluster. Let me leave you with a few take home messages. First off, tires can influence the flow patterns around wheels and need to be taken into account. I think this is really the whole purpose why we're talking today is because the whole, con the whole situation is complicated. The flow around tires with wheel houses, with rims, with calipers, with brakes, with suspension and things like that, flow through these components can be very complicated. Accurate wheel models, when I say wheels, I mean tires, treads, rims, Modeling approaching, mod, these modeling approaches are important and they can account for 25 to 30 percent of the overall drag and this includes the wheelhouse. So it's something that's that's very important to take into account and because aero simulation is really kind of a keystone simulation task, meaning that the results that we get in aero may translate into or be used in other analysis down the road like aeroacoustics or soiling analysis or underhood thermal analysis, we need to make sure that we get as much accuracy as possible in this step. Simulations with advanced wheel models can be tedious to manage and tricky to consistently set. They can be tedious because different wheels have different toe and camber, they might have different rotational axes, they might have different points of rotation. If you're using a sliding mesh approach, then you have to manage the sliding mesh interfaces at each one of these wheels. If you're using GRF because of the grooves, then you need some methodology to easily extract those grooves within the system. Overall, rotating wheel boundary conditions are straightforward to set up and stable. And this is, this is by far the reason why we use these, this approach most often in our external aero analysis for vehicles. GRF is just a little bit more effort in mesh planning for the payback. So really all we need to do is just make sure that we have our tire patch with the treads split off from the rest of our wheel and then we can apply a GRF um, model to that. On the other hand, sliding mesh approaches needs both geometric and mesh planning just because we need to make sure that we have rotational symmetry in our sliding mesh interface. We need to make sure that we're leaving enough space between different components that we can fit the sliding mesh interface or simplify our geometry to not even have to worry about that. Elements can really help solve these the painful parts of setting up wheels. This is because we can use best practices. Best practices are templates that we might automate a lot of the setup and homogenize all of the setup between different team members, whether they're at the same location or around the world. And so really teams can focus on methods development in one component and then also methods application. And so really it, it kind of unif unifies a lot of the approaches that teams use to solve these types of problems. For some additional elements webinars, you can go to our YouTube channel to find different webinars on Arrow and also more details on GRF or maybe machine learning. We've already completed one webinar in our Learn by Example series, but we've got a few more coming. If you like, you can go visit our blog to find out more and also register for an upcoming webinar. And that's it. Thanks everybody for joining me today and I hope to see you at a future webinar.